Hi, I'm Devendra Kapadia, and this afternoon, Oliver Ruben Koenig and I, who both work at Wolfram, uh, will be giving a presentation on partial differential equations. Um, uh, we'll speak about some theoretical and practical aspects of partial differential equations. There'll be oscillating drums and quantum harmonic oscillators. It should be great fun. Do come along. Bye. This is a joint talk between uh, me and Oliver Ruben Koenig, who's here. Uh, Oliver and I both work on differential equations, but we've got a slightly different, very different view on things. I mostly work on symbolic solutions using D-solve, uh, D eigen system, et cetera. Oliver works on ND eigen system, and uh, it's much more than that. In fact, he's kind of uh, really pushed ND solve quite a lot in the last few years with his work on the finite element method. So when Rob Knapp uh, invited us to present this talk, uh, I told myself that really, uh, let's think of this talk in the following way. Uh, you apply to a university to study partial differential equations, and they say you're gonna take two courses. One is called Partial Differential Equation 1, which is this course. Uh, and there you learn what a PD is, how it gets solved. The most common PDs, you build up intuition, you build up all kinds of things. And then you really want to try and use what you've learned in some substantial way, and that's when uh, symbolic methods start showing the limitations. So uh, my talk is on symbolic PDs. Oliver will speak about numeric PDs, but my example will be very simple. Uh, I'll try and give you a brief overview of what we have on the symbolic side. And uh, if I can tell you the nine most important PDs in my eyes at this level, I think the talk would have succeeded in its uh, objective. So that's my plan to give you a very brief, simple introduction to symbolic PDs. Okay, so here is a, an outline of my talk. So uh, I'll begin with first order PDs, and uh, I've chosen linear and nonlinear examples to give you a feel for what can go wrong, even in that simple case. So first order PDs are already pretty challenging to solve. And then if you're taking a course on PDs, of course you'd want to solve the classical PDs, the wave equation, uh, the heat equation, and the Laplace equation. So the second part of the talk will be about classical PDs. But fortunately, PDs have gone on developing for the last century, so I'll take up three modern PDs, and the ones I've chosen are the Burgers equation from fluid dynamics, the Black-Scholes equation from finance, and uh, the Schrodinger equation from quantum mechanics, uh, which is work done by Eta, as I'll mention later on. But uh, these three should give you a flavor of what's going on in the world of PDs right now. Now, uh, honestly, on the symbolic side, we tend to focus on low orders, but we do have some support for high order PD and systems, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll go a level deeper and ask, how do you solve a PD? And that uh, requires solving the so-called sturm level problem, and so I'll talk about the sturm level problem, which we have begun to solve in the last couple of years. And finally, uh, it turns out that often you don't want the whole solution of PD, you just want a few, what you call, eigenfunctions. And so I'll talk about differential eigen systems. So the talk is gonna be very uh, simply structured, simple examples, and uh, do feel free to ask me questions as you go along and make comments because uh, this really is meant to be a, an introduction, a gentle introduction. Okay, so let's begin with first order PDs. And my first example over there is the transport equation, which is about as simple as things can get. So the transport equation is a linear first order PD. It's linear in both the derivatives you can see over there. And if you try and solve it to the desolve, then the answer is quite simple. In fact, it's a, it's a kind of traveling wave over here, as you can see. But uh, there is an arbitrary functions freedom over here. This confused people, but really you have an arbitrary functions freedom in the solution of this very simple uh, PDE. So what you can do then is to give some kind of initial value, what's called a Cauchy problem for PDEs, and uh, then you solve it, and you get back a particular solution. So there's a huge family of solutions. You can pick out one with this kind of initial value problem. And finally, having done all that, you do want to see the traveling wave. So you can animate it, and uh, there's a traveling wave. Uh, starts on left, moves to the right, and uh, eventually it gets to the uh, right-hand point. But it's very simple, predictable motion over here. It's a linear PD, and nothing can go wrong. 
So linear first order PDs are on the whole rather simple and boring, but still very important. Okay, so now I go on to a slightly harder kind of PD, the so-called uh, quasi-linear first order PD. So that means that you have, uh, you got a, a U times a derivative over here, it's no longer linear, but even with this simple example, things change dramatically. You don't have any notion of a complete explicit solution. So if you try and solve desolve, you get back a solved object. So essentially, there's not much hope of doing much with it. But even so, with someone like me, I know enough to say that in some simple cases, we can actually give the initial values like I've done over here and get back an explicit solution. But in general, in the quasi-linear case, you're already well past trying to solve things explicitly. In fact, things can go dramatically wrong. You can have shock waves. You can have all kinds of behavior happening even for uh, these scalar conservation laws. Okay, so that's quasi-linear, almost non-linear. And now we're going to non-linear PDs. So this is what we call a Clarov equation. It looks pretty difficult, but in fact, it's very simple. So it's x times the first derivative over here, and then y times the first derivative over there, and then anything you like over there, doesn't matter what, okay? And whatever you do over here, you can solve this in some sense. So what you can do is to find a complete integral. So these are not really uh, general solutions, they are very special kinds of solutions. So when I implemented it a long time ago, Stephen quickly pointed out that you know you really cannot do these solutions. So you see a volume machine over here saying that's a nonlinear PD, we are trying to build a special solution. Now the solution over here looks quite boring. It's got an, a linear term in X and a linear term in Y and almost nothing else. But then uh, geometrically, it's a two parameter family of planes. That's a lot of planes. So what you can do is you can take a one parameter family from there and then let it generate a surface. And that so-called envelope is again a solution because after all they share the same tangent plane everywhere. So here's this idea of an envelope. Okay, so uh, you see over here that the orange one is the plane and the blue one is the surface which that family of planes is enveloping. So once you have a one parameter family of planes, you can then generate a solution for this rather difficult nonlinear PD. And that's exactly how DSOL works. In fact, I chose this example by looking at the implementation, and uh, that's how we solve this initial value problem over here. Okay, so for nonlinear PDs, we start with a complete integral build envelopes, and then we have more interesting solutions. So that's the whole story about first order PDs, but uh, in general, there's not much hope of getting uh, expert solutions. Okay, so surely uh, the most important PDs in the world are the wave equation, the heat equation, and the Laplace equation, so I'll spend some time on those. Uh, so, here's the wave equation, uh, technically, it's a linear, that's linear in the derivatives. It's second order, the second derivatives, and it's hyperbolic, which means that if you have any information, then that information is going to flow along a certain track, but it must be preserved along the line. So if you have a singularity to start, then it must be preserved all along the way. So the classic example of that is a plucked string. So you leave a, a, a violin somewhere in a corner, a child comes, plucks it, and runs away, and then what happens is the violin string goes up and down, okay? So uh, naturally the, the ends don't move. That's a boundary condition. And then I give it a piecewise condition because the string got plucked, let's say, one third of the way on the left. And now, hand it over dissolve. This is a hard integration. So it takes some time. Uh, typically we can use Fourier transform methods, Laplace transform methods, um, separation of variables. We try all of them. Uh, in this case, we are opting for separation of variables, and so it's building up a kind of Fourier series of uh, waves over here. Okay, so when it's done, we will actually have a complete solution, uh, complete in the sense of complete, not like complete integral, okay, of the 
wave equation. But the PFAS integration is difficult because you really need to take care about where you're on the string, et cetera. Okay, so that's the solution. Oh, it came back, okay, good. Okay, so now having done it, that's an infinite sum, so you can uh, pull out, let's say, 100 terms from it, and then you let it go, and here is the plucked string animation with dsolve. And to the best of my knowledge, this would be pretty hard to achieve uh, accurately with a numerical method. So it will always be the case that there'll be examples which are better suited for numerics and for symbolics, with the numerics people, of course, being far ahead of us when it comes to any kind of practical application. Okay, so uh, that's the wave equation, and now I go on to the heat equation, which is just the very opposite. So with the heat equation, uh, it's a linear second order parabolic equation, which means that as time goes by, it's gonna dissipate information. You lose information over here. Okay, so let's take a bar which is insulated both ends, and what will happen is that eventually it will uh, become uniform temperature everywhere. Okay, so let's say initial temperature is given by that expression over there, so it's 20 on the left, 100 on the right, let's see what happens. Okay, so you solve the heat equation with these conditions, and uh, again, it's separation of variables, that's the most useful kind of solution over here. But in this case, you get back kind of exponential decaying functions, okay, so not, it's not so difficult integration. But uh, the heat equation is certainly a very important uh, PD. Okay, that's the solution, the complete solution. You extract a few terms from it, 10 is good enough over here, I think. Okay, each term is a solution, and then you plot the results, and you see that initially the blue line is the initial temperature, and then as time goes by, it settles down to the equilibrium temperature of uh, 60 degrees. So that's a nice illustration of how the heat equation works. And finally, uh, the Laplace equation, which is a classic example of a linear elliptic PD, and that's something that Oliver knows a lot more about than I do, but anyway, uh, what mean, that means is that you can specify conditions on the boundary of a domain, like a geometrical thing on a region. So I've got a piecewise boundary condition, like a unit triangle. I give it to D solve. It solves it. It's, the speed is not too bad over here. I extract lots of terms, 300 of them doesn't matter. It's pretty easy over here. And then I plot the solution. And uh, what you get back is showing you various things. It's showing you that although the boundary data were quite jagged, the solution itself is very, very smooth. And uh, you can see that you got a kind of saddle point in the middle, so the extrema occur only on the boundaries. And at this point, I'd say that I, I, I've looked at maybe 30 books on PDs. I haven't seen a single picture illustrating this anywhere. And it looks to me like the, it's time for someone to write a really good book on PDs which shows this kind of thing in a simple way. Uh, to show that, that for elliptic PDs, you actually do have a kind of maximum principle. Okay, so that's the classical PDs, and uh, now on to the modern PDs. So my first example is the so-called Burgers equation, which uh, Burgers invented to try and study turbulence. He really wanted to understand turbulence, but uh, so that's the equation. The epsilon over there is a kind of viscosity constant. Now, if you're a mathematician and you want to study turbulence, the last thing you want is for someone to come and tell you that your equation can be solved explicitly. And poor fellow, he really did that, and uh, even with this piecewise condition, you can actually solve this equation completely because, guess what? It reduces the heat equation. So the heat equation is enough to solve the mighty Burgers equation. Okay, so take some time because there's an integration going on over there, but uh, eventually we do get back a solution for the Burgers equation. Okay, so there you are, and the error functions over there are telling you it all came from the heat equation. That's an error function over there. Right, okay, so you plot the solution, and it's a heat equation after all, so the solution is smooth. But then, as you move on to the limit, 
when this epsilon approaches zero, you do see some kind of shock behavior coming in. So you can see over here that as epsilon becomes very, very small, you actually have a shock solution developing. And uh, in fact, the Burgers equation then becomes the scalar conservation law. It's called the inviscid Burgers equation. So these have been studied for a long time by Peter Lacks and people like that, and they're kind of important for real world applications to understand what's going on for shock waves, et cetera. Okay, so now into the Black-Scholes equation, which was, I think, discovered around 1973, 74, in a paper by Black and Scholes. So this is the Black-Scholes equation. The various parameters have got meaning in financial terms. The sigma is volatility. I think R is the rate of interest, et cetera. And guess what? The Black-Scholes equation can again be solved by reducing it to the heat equation. And in fact, Black and Scholes say in the paper, we make a transformation, get the heat equation, and we are done. Okay, so that's the solution. So the main point is that whether it's the Black-Scholes equation or the Burgers equation, whether it's turbulence or finance, the heat equation rules. But of course, we neither understand turbulence nor do we understand finance. Okay, so again, maybe turbulence would be good to understand finance. I'm not so sure of it. Okay, so having got the solution, uh, I told myself, can you actually use it for something useful? I mean, DSOL doesn't do much useful stuff very often, so here you are. That's a real share price value, uh, option value calculated with DSOL, which is quite impressive. Well, you can check it with financial derivative, which, so here the uh, sigma over here, 0 0.7, et cetera, the same as what I've got over there. So when you do that, you get back exactly the same result. You see all these calculators built on the web for Black-Scholes calculations, and it seems to me that it's quite easy to build them with Mathematica, so I think that's one area which I would like to see people trying out uh, if they wish to. Okay, and finally the Schrodinger equation. So Ita has been doing some really good work on this. Ita Segev uh, is a physicist, unlike me, so he actually has been working on the 2D uh, free particle Schrodinger equation. Okay, and that's the equation. So you give it some kind of simple initial condition. You give it boundary conditions, homogeneous boundary conditions. And you notice that initially the, there's a lot of uncoupling between the two terms and initial values. But uh, when you solve it, then there's some entanglement taking place. So the wave function now becomes entangled. And as time goes by, it's going to start showing all the typical features of quantum mechanics. But to do that, you need to pass over to the probability density. Max Born taught us that you must go to the probability density to understand what's happening over here. So you do that. That's solution times complex conjugate. And I won't burden you with the whole calculation over here. I have an animation uh, available. It takes a bit of time. But it's a beautiful animation which shows the Schrodinger equation and action in two dimensions for a quantum uh, free particle. But the main point was that you do have this entangling phenomenon taking place, and it's a very nice picture of the Schrodinger equation in two dimensions. OK, so uh, on to high order PDs. And here we don't have a lot, but still worth spending a bit of time on. So this is the beam equation, it's a fourth order PD. You give it enough, enough initial conditions. We try our best, OK, over here. And I chose the example so it works, basically. But uh, you do get back a solution in this case. And uh, simple solution, but my advice to you, if you ever use desolve any of our functions, not that we've got a lot of problems with them, but it's good to check the solution is correct, OK? So let's do that over here. That's the beam equation. OK. My second example is the Kotwick de Vries equation, which is a popular nonlinear PD. These have become popular in the world of solitons. Okay. And these have got traveling wave solutions, uh, which were worked on by a group at Colorado Boulder. That's their work over here. Again, you see there are some parameters like C1 and C2. So what you can do is to give them some values to get back a particular solution, and this particular solution, in fact, 
describes a wave seen by Scott Russell in the year 1834. So in those days, there were no cars, so he was riding on horseback. He saw the wave, he chased it for a mile, lost it in the windings of the canal, came back, wrote up his work, no one believed him, etc. the usual story. But today we know these solitons are really, really important. So this is the wave of the type that Scott Russell saw on that day in 1834. But it's a remarkable exact solution for a highly complicated PD. So we do have some support for these nonlinear PDs. And finally, uh, the cauchy riemann equations, which are kind of staple for complex analysis. So this is a system of two PDs for the real and imaginary parts of a holomorphic function. Uh, in fact, they are, they are an example of what's called a hyperbolic system, but they have complex eigenvalues. values. So when I did this work, I had forgotten to put a check for complex numbers in my code, and that's how we can solve them today. Okay, so that's the initial value problem for the cauchy riemann equation, but it works pretty nicely. I put some sine integrals, et cetera, over there. You get back a solution. You know the solution must be a harmonic function. You know that. And then you can get some really pretty pictures of the solutions of this uh, system using contour plot in this case. So we have some support for high order PDs, for nonlinear PD systems, but overall it's rather shallow because that's the nature of things. They just don't have that many solutions. Okay, now at the very root of uh, these PD solution methods are the so-called term level problems. So what happens over here is you have some differential equation, like this one over here, the 1D Laplacian. It has a parameter. You give it homogeneous boundary conditions, and then you have solutions only for a discrete set of these lambdas, the so-called eigenvalues. And for a long time, you just give back zero solution. People complain a lot, but we just didn't have a language to express these solutions, but uh, we do now. So this gives back the complete set of eigenvalues for this term level problem. Okay, so you can make uh, a list of the eigenvalues, or you can go ahead and plot them, and it all works just fine. Now, the Dirichlet problem means that you got zero at both the ends over here, right? And uh, if you now go into what's called the Neumann problem, where uh, you have the derivative zero at both the sides, then you still get back a solution. And you can again make a table, you can plot it, but this time you get cosines as the eigenfunctions because that's the derivative condition. Things quickly get difficult. In fact, that's what uh, stopped us from progressing over here. So uh, when you come to the so-called Robin condition, where you have a linear combination on the left interval or the interval and another condition over here, then you no longer can solve the eigenvalue equation in closed form. So things start going quite really wrong over here because you get back this transcendental equation to solve. So a typical textbook will have something like tangent of lambda equal to lambda as a basic example in this area. So let's try and locate the roots of this equation. And uh, you see that between, let's say, 1 and 10, you have a root near 4, and you have a root near 7-something. And what you can do is you can tell dsolve that I don't want all the solutions over here. I just want the solutions that lie between 1 and 10 using assumptions. In fact, that's why we have the assumptions option in dsolve. And you get back this these kind of pretty difficult looking root objects. And they're meant to be friendly, okay? Although people don't uh, necessarily feel that way. But this over here is an approximate value for root. Uh, that's another approximate value for another root. And these are exact objects. And they are so exact that you can evaluate them, let's say, to 10,000 decimal places like over here. There you are, 10,000 decimal places. Uh, so the real problem is, how do you make them more kind of pleasant and usable for uh, users? And that's what we're trying to do at the moment, to try and make these root objects kind of presentable uh, in a nicer way. OK, so now uh, I go on to the last uh, topic, which is differential eigen systems. 
So often you don't want the whole solution of D solved, you just want a few solutions, that's good enough. You don't want the whole set of solutions, so that's what D-Eigen system does. Uh, Oliver worked on any eigen system, I borrowed a design, and the D-Eigen system, is you just get back the first four eigenvalues and the first four eigen functions for the Laplacian operator with Dirichlet conditions on the interval zero to pi. And again, you can plot them. And then Eta did some good work on this problem. So he worked with the quantum harmonic oscillator, which is a pretty difficult problem. And he worked out the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So what you see over here are the ladder of eigenvalues for the quantum harmonic oscillator. You go up the ladder over here. Okay, and once again, uh, you want to breathe life into the eigenfunctions, so you put some time component, and then uh, you build a product density function, and finally, uh, I won't really evaluate the, the plot, but rather show you the animation itself uh, in final form. But this is a remarkable animation uh, which shows the power of Mathematica for this kind of computation. But I haven't seen this kind of thing in any textbook or any other place. So, Okay, now uh, it's very nice when I can do something for DSOL. It's even nicer when someone like Itai or someone else can come and do something with that function, like the quantum mechanics applications. And even nicer when some user in the wild, so to speak, right to saying, you know, I've done a nice application. So a couple of weeks ago, John Snyder, who is a, a long time user of Mathematica, and in fact, a retired actuary, uh, wrote to me saying, you know, I have worked out the vibrations of a circular drum with the eigen system. Uh, the whole story is a bit more complicated, but basically he was trying to tell me that if you take a drum and you strike it on the middle, that's not very interesting. You strike it on the side, just give it a hit like that, let it go, that's a hard problem to solve. And he's done it. Okay, so we had some email exchange. He did most of the work over here, so this really is John Snyder's work. So you take the Laplacian, you are on a disk, uh, you work out the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Uh, people who know about this know that they are Bessel zeros and Bessel functions. And then here are the eigenfunctions. Uh, I realized there was a kind of bug in DSOL, in the eigen system, which was giving uh, branch cuts for these eigenfunctions. I fixed that. And uh, then John took it from there, and uh, he used the first 120 eigenfunctions to build this animation of a circular drum head. So that's my final example, and uh, it really shows the power of our symbolics, the power of our um, visualization, et cetera. So, uh, let, let D eigen system play the drum as the final example. So this is the circular drum head with an impulsive hit at one third of the way to the boundary. And uh, it's pretty remarkable you can do so many uh, term calculations with our symbolic functions. So that really is it for me. And uh, what does the future hold? Well, in the future, we want to have more integral transform methods, and we realize there's a limit to what you can do with exact solutions. So we want the system of PDs, but we want approximate solutions of these systems. So in some future release, I don't promise when, we will have a large system of PDs done with, let's say, series solutions or the kind of solutions. So that's the plan for DSOLVE in the near future, okay? So with those remarks, I'll stop over here, and if there are any questions, it's fine, as well, hand over to Oliver. Thank you very much. All right, so I'll, I'll continue. Uh, actually, there's a lie on the slide. My name is not Oliver, I'm N. Devendra. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now jokes aside, um, my name is Oliver and I work in the numerics department. So I basically work on everything that is uh, numerics and finite element related. So we use the finite element method to solve PDEs and other things uh, over regions. So basically if you use um, NDSolve with the finite element method or 
and the eigensystem or interpolating functions over regions or maybe in, and integrate with the finite element method specified, that's things um, I work on. Now, NDSolve has been around in uh, mathematics for, for quite a while, and there's been a lot of stuff being put into NDSolve for which I cannot take claim, but I quickly wanted to point out that uh, there's really a lot of other stuff. So NDSolve is able to solve ordinary differential equations, boundary value type of equations, delay differential, equa differential equations, hybrid and discontinuous uh, equations, differential algebraic equations, and there's partial differential equations, and in those there's the ones with rectangular regions, and then there's arbitrary regions. So the thing I'm working on is the last point, the arbitrary uh, regions for NDSolve for partial differential equations. And this is basically what my talk's gonna be about. Um, I'll focus a little bit on um, boundary conditions in this talk because I feel that's something that we're, I'd like to explain a bit, uh, a bit better and there was some, some new development. So, okay, if you, if you wanna solve PDEs, what do you need? You need three things. You need the PDE, you need a region and uh, some kind of a, of, a, of a boundary condition. Then you solve the PDE and then you have a visualization or like a post-processing step, step. Typically, that's some kind of a visualization. Um, how does it, uh, oops, uh, yeah, so, uh, solve a uh, post-processing process. So if we look at the PDE, actually I'm only concerned with a single PDE and that's the PDE you see here, that's something called coefficient form. So it has a second order time derivative, a first order time derivative, uh, div, grad, so basically, this shows all type of derivatives in space up to second order and derivatives of time also up to uh, second order. So I'm saying I'm only concerned with a specific PDE, but if you look at it a little closer, you see in blue highlighted specific PDEs that you might be familiar with. For example, the first one is the Laplace equation. So grayed out are all the terms that are not active in this specific part to, to represent a Laplace equation. If we have a Poisson equation, we get another, an F on the right-hand side, Helmholtz type equation, convection diffusion reaction equations. So you see, in this coefficient form, all these classical PDEs are embedded. So that's basically, I'm concerned with this coefficient form of this PDE, and that's what I'm trying to solve. This is the only PDE I'm really concerned with. Okay, how do you use that? So typically, in the setup, you specify some kind of a region. You'd say, okay, the region is a disk. You have an operator, Laplacian minus one, so this is type of a Poisson type of equation, and then you specify some kind of a boundary condition. In this case, I've chosen a Dirichlet condition, and say that the dependent variable u is supposed to be zero everywhere where x is larger than zero on this, on this region. You then call ndsolve value or ndsolve, same thing, just a little bit of a different output with the speci uh, specifications I've just given, and then you use uh, Plot 3D, for example, to visualize the solution. That's what NDSolve is, uh, is capable of, of solving over this uh, specific disk. This is just to give you an overview of what the workflow typically uh, looks like. So, and that's then the visualization of the solution. Now, boundary conditions for the finite element method that we have is currently three. So we can specify Dirichlet conditions that specifies a specific value on the boundary where you want to apply the Dirichlet condition. We can specify a Neumann value that specifies a flux over an edge on the boundary, and I'm gonna explain that in a little more detail just now. And then newly added, we have um, periodic boundary conditions and arbitrarily boundary, shaped, uh, boundary shapes. So, and I'm also gonna show a few examples uh, of that. So, here are the Dirichlet condition and the Neumann value. Where could you apply them? So, in, uh, in blue, you see positions where you could apply the Dirichlet condition. So it could be outside of a region, it could be in an inner hole, or it could even be at a material boundary. So that's another place where you could apply Dirichlet conditions. Um, the Neumann value is typically either at an inner region, like an inner hole or something like that, or an outer edge. Um, these boundary conditions are specified by two arguments. The Dirichlet condition sees the dependent variable equals to something, the value you want to specify, and the predicate where that Dirichlet condition is supposed to apply. The Neumann value is quite similar. It gets a value uh, of this type, G minus Q type, the dependent variable, and the predicate where that's supposed to be true. I'm gonna talk about where that specific form of the Neumann value comes about uh, just now. So, 
What I'm going to try now is I'm going to try to explain the finite element method in a half a slide. So it, it's, 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 not, it's not completely insane, just a bit. So basically what you have, so remember we had this coefficient form in the beginning. So the finite element method works by taking this coefficient form, plugging it to, into an integral, and multiplying it with something called the test function phi. That's basically what I've done in the first, first row. This coefficient form is plugged into this integral multiplied by phi and set to zero. So the finite element method tries to find a solution to a PDE in a weak sense. So it's not trying to find the exact solution, but a weak solution. So what you do then is you take this, this um, reformulation, and phi is completely unspecified. We don't know what phi is, and it doesn't matter for now, actually. We integrate this thing by parts, and there you see you get an integral over the domain and an integral over the boundary condition, or some uh, integral over the boundary that has a normal vector in it. So that's n times dot uh, c nabla u blah blah blah. And this specific integral, or the contents of this integral, is what is replaced with a Neumann value. When you specify a Neumann value, you replace this part of the integral. That is, that is what's happening internally. I never ever compute actually the normal, normal value, I just replace the contents of this integral. That's what mathematically is happening when you uh, apply a Neumann value. Okay, here's an example. Poisson type of equation. Uh, we have minus c nabla u. Uh, I specify some arbitrary region here. I have the Laplacian operator minus 20. I set a Dirichlet condition on some part of the boundary condition. And now I'd like to specify a Neumann value n, where the normal is n time uh, dot c nabla u equals minus 2u. Whatever that means, it doesn't really matter now. What internally happens is, so I spec this, this value minus 2u is You'll put that into the Neumann value, and that is actually then internally replacing the integral, the boundary integral we had from the derivation earlier. And then you get the solution uh, like depicted below. So the boundary, the Dirichlet condition is on the upper left-hand part, where it's put down to a specific value, and the, on the inner circle we have a specified flux of minus two times the dependent variable. Okay. Um, the special, the, the special thing about this is also that this is actually on an arbitrary shaped region and uh, it has a hole. So that's something Andy Solve only learned to do at about version 10. Yeah, you have a question. Um, the question is whether you have control over the test functions, not directly. You could if you wanted to, but that would involve your own programming. The test functions we currently use are so-called serendipity functions, if you, if you are into the finite element word. So there are serendipity type of uh, test functions. Um, maybe we, we could talk about this a little, a little later. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, yeah. Very quick. Could you refresh my memory? The flux is negative, so does that mean it's going out of the region or into the region? It's going out of the region. And yeah, it's, it's, it has to be negative. Yes, exactly. And that's a very good um, one thing I, um, I forgot to mention. So note that actually the content of minus C nabla u, the Laplacian, is in just exactly the negative term of what is in the Neumann value. You never specify the C in the Neumann value because you only need to specify the right hand side. This Neumann value is tightly, tightly coupled to the equation you are actually trying to solve. Okay. Yeah. And they're all functions of the spatial variables? They are all functions of the spatial variable of time. Um, okay, they can be of time. They cannot be yet dependent of the dependent variable itself. They cannot yet be nonlinear, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, where, where would it... okay. Periodic boundary conditions. That's a new uh, boundary condition we introduced in version 11. Uh, what that does you specify a predicate where the boundary condition is supposed to be, where you want periodicity. Then you specify, um, no, no, sorry. You first specify a, a relation of how the function, the dependent variable, is supposed to relate to another part on the boundary. So you want to say, you just want the, the at the bottom example, I have a periodic boundary condition, and I want the dependent variable, u, and I want that at the outer circle, which is the blue one in the, in the picture below. Uh, I want 
that is the, the target region. So what happens is with the second function, that maps the points on the blue region onto the green region. I evaluate the dependent variable u, and those values are actually used then in the solution. So this is a, a, a somewhat, um, the mechanism is somewhat complicated, but if you get used to it, it I think it makes, uh, it makes sense. So in this case, I have, uh, I have a cutout region, I have a Dirichlet condition on the upper and the lower edge of these boundaries, and I have a periodic boundary condition that takes the value of the green side and puts it to the blue side. And if you look at the solution, so here's the solution then, the left-hand side has, has this red spot, and the corner or the, the outer edge of that spot is reflected onto the inner side there. So that's how the periodicity works. Now, one thing is, what I've shown here is so these edges are, they look exactly the same, so they're just a direct mapping, but that's not necessarily, you don't have to do that. They can be deformed or anything like that. You just, if you have a projection from one side to the other, to the other you can actually, uh, you're quite flexible of what you can, um, you can project. Um, okay. That works in 3D as well, just uh, so same thing. So Laplacian um, equals to one Poisson type of equation on a cube. We have a Dirichlet condition which says the up, the, the side parts of, of that cube are held fixed at, at uh, zero. And we take the values from, uh, let me have a look, from, uh, so it, yeah, right, thank you, Itai. <laughs> um, you, you map the, the, the points from the x zero uh, on the right hand, uh, to the right hand side, and those are made equal then. So there is a periodicity there. Okay. Um, next, I'd like to talk a bit about boundary conditions for wave type of equations. One thing I'd like to, uh, um, uh, to, to mention is second order time derivative or higher order time derivative equations can be reformulated into systems of first order equations, and that's going to be important in a second. Um, so, if you now specify uh, a second a wave equation, second order time derivative, second order spatial derivative, have some initial condition, um, I've used an error function type of thing, and, um, right, and you, you, you solve that with ND solve and with, use the finite element, that's something you, you uh, that's how that would behave. So you, the wave spreads out and it comes back from the edges. So it's a reflecting boundary that you have. But what you might want to have, you might want to have an absorbing boundary condition. What I'm gonna to try to show you now is how that is actually uh, modeled. So. so in order to model this absorbing boundary condition, I used exactly the same equation I had before, this reflecting boundary condition. But now I specify a Neumann value on the temporal derivative of the time dip of, of the of u. What does it mean? If we remember from earlier, we had a, a second order time derivative replaced as two equations, first order equations. So that means this Neumann value is working on the auxiliary variable in this reformulated equation. And if we do that and use this absorbing type of model, then the wave equation uh, starts to look like that, and the wave is actually absorbed in the boundaries. And this stuff, this is just a 1D example, but you can do this in 2 and 3D. This is just to, to show how you'd model um, absorbing boundary conditions. And now, oops, that was a step too far. So, and now, because we have uh, per the periodic boundary condition, we can now also uh, have a wave traveling out of one side of the region and back into the other side of the region. Uh, what I've done now, I've changed the initial condition, uh, the, sorry, the initial condition stays the same. However, I use a derivative of the initial condition um, to give it an initial velocity. The wave, the wave has an initial velocity now. And if we use that, then you'll see that the wave travels out of one side and back into the other side. So this combination of using a derivative on the temporal variable and periodic boundary conditions allows you to now model um, a traveling wave out of a, of a periodic region 
going out of one end and re-entering at the other end, at another end. Okay, so that's, that's that. One other thing um, I wanted to show that I thought is maybe a little bit um, didn't, that I'd, that I'd like to promote a little more is actually one thing you can do with ndsolve and the finite element method that you cannot do in, to, best, to the best of my knowledge in any other tool is like interactive PDE solving. So I have a Laplace equation here, a Poisson type equation here, and I have a rectangle inside that region. And if I now touch this, this corner point, it uses a very coarse grid, and I can actually move about and actually interactive see how the solution is solved, uh, how this equation is solved. And as soon as I release it, the mesh is refined, and a proper solution is computed. I thought that's a, uh, that's a neat thing to, to show because I don't think there's many other tools that actually allow you interactive, real-time PDE solving. Okay, so now we're doing ND eigensystem, so same thing like the vendor did, just in numerics on arbitrary regions. And again, the only equation I'm concerned about is up there is still again this coefficient form. The only difference now is that I'm trying to solve not for f equals f, but lambda u. So uh, an eigenvalue problem. Again, I need a PDE, I need a region, and I need some boundary conditions, possibly. I don't necessarily need them for eigensystems, but um, you can specify them. First example, and the eigensystem, Laplacian, a negative Laplacian, u is independent variable from zero to pi, and I want four eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Those are the eigenvalues uh, I, I showed there, and there's a plot of the eigenfunctions. Uh, okay. Next example, we add a boundary condition. So this is a, a constraint eigenvalue, and the constraint is on the left-hand side, x equals uh, zero. We set the dependent variable to, to zero. And then we get slightly different eigenvalues, and the eigenmodes also look a little bit different. We can now also solve um, periodic eigenvalue problems. Um, in this case, I have uh, a Laplacian, and this is kind of a, an, so it's a, it's a Schrodinger type equation with an asymmetric potential. Um, the periodic boundary condition uses the dependent variable u, um, goes from x equals 2 pi, and gets the solution from minus 2 pi, from the position at minus 2 pi, and that is uh, the solution for this asymmetric uh, potential. Now, what we can do is, we can also solve uh, anti-periodic boundary conditions. And now, see, for example, the green line uh, on the right-hand side is at, a, is what, 0 0.5, roughly. And if we follow that, should be by, I don't see it actually. Maybe the blue one is a bit better. So the blue one starts at 0 0.1, 1.5 on the left-hand side and goes to 0 0.15 on the right-hand side. So that's an anti-periodic boundary condition. We could also have multiples of that, like we wanted two times of u. And again, the plot changes a bit. So this is a way how you can influence how the dependent variable is supposed to behave on the periodic boundary condition. Um, yeah, OK. And the Eigen system, of course, works in 2 and 3D. Uh, what we have here is a, an image mesh of, of, a salt, of the salt lake. And um, something like Stephen showed in his talk, basically it computes the eigenfunctions uh, of the Salt Lake. Uh, if you have a Dirichlet condition uh, set to zero, all, on the, all around on the boundary. Um, one other thing I'd like to talk about uh, that is not yet available, this is gonna be available in 11.1, .1. that's the automatic grouping of boundaries. So I have a somewhat complicated oh, uh, numerical region there. Uh, and uh, I generate uh, a boundary element mesh. Um, that's what it looks like, the wireframe of that. 
What now happened internally is that the element mesh actually computes the normals of each of these edges and groups them together by normals. So you see I have um, five or six boundary element markers, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I've colored the boundary mesh according to the groups it has found. Now, why would that be important? I can now actually say I'd like to use markers two and four, for example, which I found, and I can plot them. So I see this is the inner side and the outer side of the boundary. And I can actually use these selections to specify Dirichlet boundary conditions. So what you see here now in the, slow, oops, in the slower part, I've used this selection here as a, oops, uh, as, a, as a predicate in the Dirichlet condition and specified, used that to solve the PDE. Um, okay. This works for complicated geometries as well. So if you have a crankshaft or something like that, there's no way you're going to specify X, Y, Z, is this and that and whatnot. This will automatically, automatically group the boundaries for you, so you can then call ndsolve, specify the boundary condition, and say, at this specific example, or that specific marker, I'd like to have that boundary condition. Um, okay. I did lie a bit in the beginning when I said I'm just in, uh, well, a little bit. So I said I'm only concerned with one PD. It's true, it's only one PD, but you can couple them. So you can now have, this is an example of two PDEs. It's in U and V, in this case, are the dependent variables. The equations get a bit longer. And note that in the first equation, we have C11 nabla U, C12 nabla V, and in the second equation, we have C21 nabla U and C22 nabla V. These are all possible cross-couplings between the equations. So anything you'd like to model, there is no limit in how you can cross-couple between these equations. Dirichlet conditions can be cross-coupled, and the Neumann values can also be cross-coupled. What can you do with that? For example, structural mechanics in 3D. Um, I've, uh, I've, in, in the notebook, there's a small definition of a, of a stress operator. That's not, not really important how that actually looks like. It's basically a set of nine Laplace couplings. That's what I, I tried to show there. And what I have now, I have, what I'd like to do is I'd like to compute the structural eigenmodes of a clarinet. So if you, if you were to strike the clarinet, how would the clarinet actually resonate? I generate a mesh, and that mesh now has actually inserted these boundary groups that I've shown earlier into that mesh. So there's different parts on the boundary that have different, uh, different groups. Um, and I can now, for example, use something like a manipulate to actually scan through these, these boundaries. So you see different parts are actually highlighted now. Uh, and if I, if I open that up, I actually so this is the marker number 22, edge 22, 25. And that, with that mechanism, you can actually go through your geometry, find the, the regions you're interested in, and then use that. Well, it's rendering, I think. Oh, no, no, we're too far. <laughs> There's one. Okay, there we go. So it was rendering a bit. Um, what I've done now is I've used this clarinet example and specified three selections on the geometry. I said the, the mouthpiece is, uh, is not to move, and then two circular parts, which I've marked in red on the, on the final examples as well, are held fixed. And I've computed and set those, those vibrational eigenmodes to zero. They, they, there's no movement in x, y, or z direction. And I've computed, uh, what, 20 of these eigenmodes have just displayed a, a couple of them that looked somewhat, uh, somewhat interesting. So just to make it clear, this is not how the, how, the, um, how the clarinet sounds. It's just if you were to use a clarinet and hit it with a stick or something like that and hold it, that's how it would move, resonate, so something like that. OK, and that's uh, the end of the talk. And dissolve and dissolve rock. <laughs> so what we can do is we can solve complex valued um, variable coefficient PDEs. I didn't show all of these things here. We can have events in these PDEs as well. Um, 
transient stationer, eigensystem analysis, orbit, arbitrary regions, one, two, three dimensions um, in parallel. Uh, yeah, and if you have questions, my email is rubenco at wolfram.com. It's not a secret. If you work on PDEs and stuff like that, send me an email. You're more than welcome to do that. Thank you for your attention.